that's pretty in sync. Max is always concerned. Grandpa? Another change, Cyborg Vilgax gets hit while regular Vilgax dodges. That's twice now that regular Vilgax has been quicker than his Cyborg counterpart. Starting to make me question which one is better. This is where the timeline really splits, because this didn't happen at all. Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Today we'll be taking a look at the infamous episode Gwen 10, which if you couldn't tell by the title, involves Gwen getting the Omnitrix before Ben, and seeing how she handled last season's familiar situations. Many parts of this episode makes direct parallels to the pilot in the season 1 finale, Secrets. So for those segments, I've taken the liberty of setting up the episode side by side so that we can accurately compare them, and we can see how each version was handled. This will also give us some insight on what shots were reused, what shots were edited, and what shots were reanimated completely from the ground up. Let's get ready to jump right in, but first, a few quick updates. Let's get the most exciting one out of the way first. That's right, I'll be collaborating with the Watchtower database for a video coming out this month on the 28th. So if you guys are into the DC animated universe, or just want to make sure that you don't miss out on this collab, go subscribe to the Watchtower database and show them some love. Next, we have the results of last week's poll. Out of the three episodes from the last breakdown, Framed won as the most popular favorite episode. While most polls, we usually do have one option that's obviously going to win, this one actually surprised me. I really thought this one was going to be the first poll that would be more divided. As I would say, all of these episodes are pretty solid, but I guess you just can't beat Kevin when it comes to popularity. <laughs> Lastly, we are still hard at work at the next episode of And Beyond. But if you guys are familiar with the recent weather issues that Texas is having, which is where showrunner and primary artist O.R. Ash is located, you can expect that, yeah, this did cause a few issues. That combined with my personal focus now being on these breakdowns and further developing 5YL, it's really out of my hands now at how production of this episode will develop. I'd say Ash is the best person to know more information on the production of the next and beyond, but this is not me giving you my blessing to go harass him. Ash is one of the hardest working and most talented people I know, so please be patient with him as he continues to put his efforts towards entertaining you guys inside of the 5YL multiverse. That's all for today, so let's get right into that breakdown. On June 1st, 2006, the fourth episode of the second season premiered under Greg Klein's penmanship titled Gwen 10. Ben, or at least a version of him, has seemingly traveled back in time to the events of the first episode, but still retains the knowledge of all of the adventures he's had over the summer so far. But some things have changed in this timeline, even without his direct influence. Gwen ends up getting the Omnitrix instead of Ben, and Vilgax somehow survives his galactic battle with Xylene, and goes after the Omnitrix a lot sooner than they had planned. Let's see how Ben handles trying to put things back to the way they should be. <laughs> So he suddenly wakes up in the middle of the day. This is probably him first becoming conscious in whatever reality or alternate timeline he's just been transported to. Seems like they try to keep his Omnitrix arm hidden. Ah! Gwen! Ugh, when are these losers ever gonna learn? Yep, you still can't see his Omnitrix. The way the eyes do this full panning shot across each uh, character's eyes, it reminds me a lot of the pilot episode where the same thing happens with Ben, JT, and Cash. Now, effect like this is so general, it can be applied to pretty much anything, but I do think this is a reference to the pilot just because this whole episode is made up of references to the first season. Forearms like spicy. Hey. I like the visual of him slapping his wrist and realizing it's not there, but I mean, you have to press the button first and select an alien. And our first introduction to the comic book style segments of the What If episodes, I believe there's only two. It's a good method, but I don't feel like it's used enough for people to really understand that comic book intros means alternate universe. But his life is a story. I like how they went for a full comic book art style for this segment. Like it's not just the characters drawn in comic book panels, but this is clearly a different art style. This page is really cool to look at. I almost wonder if these lines right here are supposed to to imply some sort of pupil. Lovely silhouette shot of the rust bucket. And this guy is just no question about to hit this kid with an iron bar. 
Don't just stand there. Thank you. That reminds me of like when people in pretty much any movie or show, something's about to fall on them and they just stare up at it. Like if someone has the time to push you out of the way, you have the time to run out of the way yourself. Yeah, there's the shock of the moment, but it's like every character, no matter who they are, unanimously decides that if something's about to fall on them, they have to just stand there and look at it. How hard would you have to throw a gas pump in order to knock someone off of a moving motorcycle? And Max doesn't seem phased at all. He's like, I trained for this. Oh, you want some too? Here comes Max's infinite strength. Boom. Oh, I really can't tell if this is supposed to be blood or not. It seems like it's drawn that it can be taken either way. Like if anybody complained about it, they could just go, oh, that's not blood. That's coming out of whatever this bag is all the way over here. I love seeing shots like this. When characters are always wearing the same outfit every day, they're like in universe wearing the same outfit every day too. Wait, did the watch just slip off my wrist? Oh, Ben. Two weeks ago, we were on Mount Rushmore kicking Vilgax's butt. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just dodged a skunk on the road. Oh, uh, no, see, that's way too direct for me. If he mentions Vilgax and Mount Rushmore, Max should just come clean right off the bat. He's too tied to keeping those secrets. Like, imagine that. Like, Ben just says that, and Max is like, all right, we got some shit to figure out. I actually think that would have made this episode more amazing. Having all three to work together to try to figure out what happened, I wouldn't say I'd change it because it would improve the episode. But that's just something I would have liked to see. Alright, I got the episode side by side to compare. So Gwen Ten skips the shot where Vilgax's ship damages Eileen's. So the droid scene does have another change to it. It does start off with them talking about the hull damage percentage, but the pilot one mentions the weapon system is still operational, while the Gwen Ten version talks about them losing power and Vilgax wants them to find them more. Hull damage 20%. Power, still operational. Find me more. I have come too that far to be destroyed. destroyed. And although Ben's presence is changing events down on Earth, he's had no effect on the space battle so far. Yet there's already changes happening here too. So this shows that events are going to play out differently regardless of whether or not Ben was there. They initiated self-destruction mode. That's new. This didn't happen the same way at all. Especially since Vilgax just stands back up. This is the same. That's Vilgax? Only the worst alien in the whole entire universe. Again, Ben just blatantly talking about Vilgax with Max there. Max, come on, just, just open up to him. Also, look how big the Rust Bucket's window is compared to the pilot. And as their roles are kind of reversed in this episode, so is their seating. I've gone back in time. That's why I'm not wearing the Omnitrix. Pretty good theory. But what would have happened to the Ben that was already in this timeline? Unless he did it mentally. Some super high-tech weapon thing. <laughs> Um, we weapon? Max, come on. No one's buying it anymore. The watch should be right down. Uh. I'm all for this, but I wish they showed why Gwen was out there. It won't come off. Well, it's way too big for you, shrimp. A nice hint that the Omnitrix can change its size. Hand it over. <laughs> More like a trained seal. Ah! There's a lot of strong poses in this animation. It seems like the same person who boarded this scene might have also boarded the scene with Heat Blast and Secrets. That used a lot of very, like, strong and exaggerated poses, too. I like it. It fits for this art style. I'm on fire. You know, as much as I like Kevin voicing his aliens, I'm glad they got different actresses for Gwen's aliens. Not that there really would have been a problem with Megan voicing the aliens, because Ben's aliens get a wide variety of voices. It is fair that Gwen's do as well. Yeah, there's the same crackling pattern. Uh, with Heat Blast from that secret scene. But that's more of an animation thing than a storyboarding thing. You could start a forest fight. <sighs> She's so casual with it. Uh... Took me like a month to learn how to do that with Heat Blast. Even figuring that out in a month is pretty impressive. Unless some sort of pyro mathematics get implemented into your pyronite brain whenever you transform. I can't imagine what you would need to do to be able to spell out your name in fireworks in the sky. Not to get too sidetracked, but it always seemed to me that Heat Blast also had the ability to manipulate his fire. Very similar to how Alien Force Gwen manipulates her mana. Because he has made solid shapes and stuff before, which is like, acceptable. But spelling your name? Maybe if they trained with Heat Blast a little bit more, he can make like fire swords or fire shields and stuff. This is the same. Ben, this isn't funny! <laughs> People are very divided on this design for Gwen. What do you guys think? Do you like the fact that Galvins have hair or no? Comment below, I'm actually curious. Logistically, I kind of don't dig the hair, but I do think it looks fine on this design. So I can go either way. How do you guys feel about it? <laughs>
we're practically seeing this shot of the hand extending here from two different angles. In the pilot, the reveal is a bit more dramatic, but it's more or less the same in Gwen 10. Gwen 10, they assume you probably saw a lot of this stuff before, so the iconic scenes, while are referenced, are shorter. The trees are different, though, so perhaps it landed in a different area. In the pilot, it lands where the Omnitrix landed, so it was first sent there to try to retrieve the device. And coincidentally, there is an explosion that lines up in both timelines. But while in the pilot, it was the droid destroying the evidence of the Omnitrix's crash, in Gwen 10, we skip all of that and cut straight to the attack at Yosemite Park. So Ben and Gwen's downtime, Grandpa Max investigating, the whole Wild Mutt droid fight, all of that gets skipped, while Gwen's all the way over fighting the droid as Diamond Head. But let's not skip ahead too far. This is a very small change, but it's the first one I actually noticed as a kid, so I just want to point it out for my own sake. When the droid scans the Diamond Heads, uh, Ben's lights up green and then each ticker comes in at a separate time, whereas in Gwen 10, it sort of zeroes in on the device. It's pretty much the same, just a different display. The pilot seems a little bit more polished and has a more active screen. Respawns pretty much the same way in both versions. Throws the guy down and blasts him back. So it was full on reanimated a lot of the times and recreated. I can appreciate that. Although the pilot does seem like it has a little bit more put into it. It is the show's pilot, so of course it's going to be really pretty. But for example, when we compare when they crash into the RV, it seems Ben's has a little bit more impact. And then obviously the explosion has more detail put into it. You can see it actually being torn apart. Whereas it looks fine in the Gwen 10 version. Like I'm not complaining about it. It just kind of gets lost in the smoke. In fact, it lifts all the way up and doesn't get blown up. Maybe that's why there's no explosion. I guess in the Gwen 10 timeline, the robot missed. Another small change in the Gwen 10 timeline, we do get the same shot, but in Gwen 10, it just fades out, whereas Ben's, you actually see him escape. Okay, so later on, I did find a clip of Gwen escaping. It just happens very quickly, and she just pushes the stuff off of her. This scene coming up lines up pretty nicely as well. Like earlier, the pilot's just got a little bit more extra touches to it. It's got the fire going in the background. Diamond Head's eyes do that glow thing, which doesn't really make sense, honestly. So maybe it's a good thing that Gwen doesn't, but it looks cool. Gwen's swing has a little uh, extra line to give it that emphasis for it. Diamond Head just kind of lunges. So I keep having to readjust the comparison so that it lines up correctly. Because as you can see, when it's reanimated, the pacing isn't 100% similar. But you can see that more or less the shots line up. Gwen 10 seems to be cutting out those extra half seconds here and there. But it does have a lot more to cover. In the pilot, this is pretty much the climax. But in Gwen 10, we're only halfway through the episode. And here we have direct parallels of what Gwen would be doing in either timeline. Yeah, the pilot version has more time focused on Ben fighting the robot. We get more reactions from the civilians. Whereas Gwen pretty much just does the main story beats that we remember. Like since the Wild Mutt droid fight never happened, we don't have this follow-up to Ben saving Gwen back when Gwen saved Ben against the droids. This also shows Gwen has a bit more of an immediate understanding of each alien's powers as she's doing a move that Ben didn't learn until episode 5, which was projecting crystals. Things are lining back up again here. Gwen's got these sparkle effects when Diamond Head forms her spikes. Robot fires the laser. Yeah, I'm still preferring the aesthetics of the pilot more. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty in sync. In the pilot, it feels more like a blinding light, whereas in the Gwen 10 one, the light doesn't really have any effect. You do see the shadows ripple a bit. These light rays also have a subtle glow, which makes it a bit blinding for the viewer. Notice how the suit is pretty gray until the light hits it and it turns pure white. Small details like that just help it feel much brighter than how it looks in Gwen 10. Another soft parallel when they're dodging the beams is discharge. It's from two different angles. We're pretty much at a shot for shot recreation now. It's really unfair to be watching them side by side, I feel, because it just makes the Gwen 10 version look just a bit less polished because it doesn't have all of those additional effects the pilot did. Now they're gonna do it. Gwen, run! Max is always concerned. Ben stops the laser just with his hands while Gwen forms a sort of diamond shield of spikes. And whether or not this says anything about the laser or each other's power levels, the laser seems stronger here and pushes Ben back into the dirt. You can even see Ben form spikes in his heels to get better gripping. Whereas in the Gwen 10 version, it keeps her in place and just reflects all around her. We get a very similar crowd shot. What comes around, goes around. Goes around. That's a great moment. Having the same finishing line also gives the moment more symmetry. Although there is one final change with how they finish the battle, and it does go back to how they reflect it with their hands. Gwen forces the diamonds into a cone, which focuses the laser back onto itself, where Ben reflects the laser all around like a mirror, 
and cuts the robot's torso off. Gwen's launches into the sky, splits in two, and then explodes. Oh, what do you know? Gwen's eyes do glow. Max's reaction splits here. In the pilot, he wants to keep Ben's identity a secret. Way to go, Ben! Um, diamond-headed guy? But in Gwen 10, he openly tells some random guy that it's Gwen. That's no thing. That's my granddaughter. Not that it really matters, this guy probably just thinks Max is crazy. But funny enough, the guy he speaks to is the only guy that appears in both versions of the scene. So Vilgax is fine, he's just chilling now. It's not about having fun. Wanna bet? Follow me. Oh, if only main timeline Gwen would see this version of Gwen. Because of all the times Gwen told Ben not to screw with the Omnitrix. Now that she's got it, all of a sudden she's like, let's use every alien. And Ben's out here trying to be the responsible one, but I feel like he's just trying to get back at Gwen for all the times she mocked him for doing pretty much the same thing. I guess it kind of goes to show that you're only really hating on it if you can't do it yourself. <laughs> Again about the aliens with hair. How do you guys feel about Gwen's forearms having hair? So Vilgax got his ship repairs pretty quickly. All of this looks brand new now. Whereas the scene prior, everything looked like this. He had all of his controls smashed, it was dark and dirty everywhere, and we've only had this quick scene in between. And it's implied this only takes place the next day. Vilgax's drones must have an excellent cleaning service. I know that feel, Ben. And that's the last Gwen 10 transformation we see. I've never thought about it when watching this before, but I really wish we got to see Gwen face off against Vilgax just a little bit. I don't know what's worse, that I'll never have the watch again, or that you're better with it than I was. Now, it's easy to brush that line off as playing into Ben's egotistical personality, but you gotta think, he's in a pretty tough spot. In his perspective, he's had a lot of time learning and growing with that power, and feeling like he actually is making a difference in the world. And now, without any explanation, not only is it at all taken from him, it's all been undone. And seeing somebody do better at what you've done before kind of makes you wonder if the world really was better off with you trying to help it in the first place. For the first time, it's really being challenged if Ben was actually the right person for this job. Which kind of sucks because this isn't an alternate timeline. Like, I don't know if it's obvious to you guys, but this isn't Ben Prime. Towards the end of the episode, Ben is still stuck in this universe and we never see him get out. So as much as I appreciate this episode as a character analysis of Ben, it doesn't actually have an effect on anything in the show. Oh, and perhaps the biggest difference of the episode of all. Props to the animators for actually letting the wrecking ball destroy the floor as it goes, and it's not just rolling on top of it, because this can't be easy. Look at all these boards they have to draw every frame. And with this, we get our first parallel to Secrets, this time in Vilgax's original form, opposed to his enhanced cybernetic form. <sighs> ben genuinely tries this. Yeah, you deserve that, dude. Come on. That should stop it from activating for a while. Ooh, that's pretty cool, but why didn't Vilgax do that the first time? Get in! Here we go, finally, Max. Then I realized you knew way too much. He knew way too much the second he said Vilgax. Now this scene is pretty similar so far. I'm glad that they did make Gwen 10's Vilgax shorter than the machine. I actually set up this comparison expecting him to be the same size, and I was gonna point that out, but no, they, they kept the sizes consistent to what it should be. Kudos to them. Really small change, and I had to raise this frame so that you guys can see it. As the floor opens up two different ways, not that big a deal, but the weapons in Gwen 10, the blade, the grips, and the weapons holder are all the same color, which is not the case in the pilot. Here. This may come in handy. Why didn't he give that to Gwen? Sword animation is a little different, but that's to be expected. But unlike the size consistency with the chamber that holds Gwen, the sword is the same size no matter which Vilgax is holding it. So technically, the sword is much bigger in the Secrets version. I really love that they do make an effort to line up the shots as much as they can, though. It makes these comparisons a lot more fun. So what's cool about this shot is all the characters here, oh, the knives are missing in the Secrets version, are new, but when it pans over, it reuses the animation from the original version. But it's the same consistent shot, it doesn't cut away. That's a really nice touch. And while big cyborg Vilgax gets hit by the RV, normal Vilgax just runs out of the way and he holds on to the sword, which big Vilgax dropped. And what makes no sense is Max runs out of the RV here with the gun without going to Mount Rushmore first. Grandpa? Hold off my grandson, Vilgax. Grandpa? Tennyson. That happens 
pretty much exactly the same. It looks like they reused the same overlay as well. Another change, Cyborg Vilgax gets hit while regular Vilgax dodges. That's twice now that regular Vilgax has been quicker than his Cyborg counterpart. Starting to make me question which one is better. What? Forearms had to rip that open and he struggled with it. 10 year old Ben just whacks it with his fist and it opens. And like in Secrets, Ben gets to use the gun. But here it's much smaller. And it's one of the first things to happen in Ben's interaction, while as in Secrets, it was one of the last things. Vilgax's ship is malfunctioning just like the last time. This is where the timeline really splits, because this didn't happen at all. I wonder how this doesn't hurt her at all. Oh, this moment was always frustrating to me as he just misses it ever so slightly. But also, Max with the Omnitrix? Yes, I am here for this. Never going hero again. You just did. Oh, how sweet. So it's a little disappointing that the only alien we get to see Grandpa use has no difference than Ben's. I guess he looks a little heftier, but I don't know if that's just me thinking that but still it's cool we get to see max use an alien that's that's great and he merges with the rust bucket max's true love and it flies man i wish ben did this more often and this is very interesting how it forms a face for max to talk when usually ben just gets a circle but eh, things just seem to look slightly different in this universe so whatever and then alley -oop. the d merge from the rust bucket looks pretty good And that's it. Sometimes you can never predict how they're going to turn out. So I really like this cover, but seeing as this is issue number one of Ben 10, shouldn't we be seeing a Gwen 10 cover? Ah, whatever. Man, what an episode, right? Now, as much as I love this episode purely because of all the callbacks and parallels to the first season, I do feel like the story was just a bit too fanservice-y to really hold up as a solid episode on its own. Now, as a fan of Ben 10, this is great. Fantastic. I can't imagine anyone disliking this episode, but obviously this is not one you can just jump right into and think, hmm, yeah, I get it. It also feels a bit strange we're getting an episode like this pretty early in the series' run. We're not even halfway through season two yet, and we're already doing the what ifs and the revisiting the pilot. I mean, I'm all for it. I think if they had this episode ready to go, they shouldn't have waited any longer. But this seems like something that would have aired during like late season four, just as it kind of has that like legacy feel to it. Like usually these kinds of episodes are meant to go back and appreciate the early days of Ben 10. But this is still kind of the early days of Ben 10. And this show isn't about time travel and dimensions yet. So as much as I like it, I'm just saying it's pretty weird to see something like this very early. But nonetheless, I'm going to give the plot a three. I did want to score it higher because I felt like it was very creative the way that they would retell these events. It's not just a, what if Gwen got the Omnitrix instead of Ben? It's a, Ben is transported to an alternate universe where he hasn't gotten the Omnitrix yet and Gwen gets it. So it's like a what if, but with a twist where like the main continuity also has an effect on this universe. But there are a fair amount of plot holes like where Max got the weapon from. How could Gwen use the Omnitrix all night but not realize it needs to recharge in the bowling alley? What happened to the drones in the park? And things that aren't exactly plot holes but still are distracting questions that don't really benefit from keeping it a mystery. Like how did Ben even get traveled back in time in the first place? Why did Vilgax survive the ship explosion this time? Seriously, where did Max get that gun? Did Ben ever find his way home or is he trapped in that universe forever? Without the interference of Kevin, is he gonna get sent to the Null Void and by this is the long chain reaction of the Rooters going to happen? All right, that one's not fair. We're like four series ahead, but still. It's a good plot when you're watching it. It flows very smoothly. I think that's largely in part to the writer Greg Klein. But once the ride is over, you sit back and go, what was that? What happened here? Why was this different? And similar to not answering why Ben gets Cannonbolt in the first place, these are one of the things I feel like we need that extra bit of info to really appreciate what's happening. I think the classic series relies a little bit too much on ambiguity and mystery, and after a while the suspense just dies down and it just feels a bit lazy. Characterization, I am going to give it a 5. There wasn't too many standout character moments, but I do feel like everyone was written pretty well, and despite my frustrations with Max not telling Ben and Gwen their secrets, it's not 
not like he didn't do that in the original timeline, so it still lines up for how he is. It's just, come on, Max. I know you mean well, but you gotta trust people. Well, except Phil. Speaking of, what's he up to in this timeline? Since they're not in Mount Rushmore, is he just getting away with all of his scams? Anyway, yeah, characterization gets a five. I don't want to elaborate too much on that. This breakdown's long enough for one episode already. Visuals, it will get a four. Everything looked good, and it was really cool to see Gwen's aliens, but it doesn't get that extra point for two reasons. One, when comparing it to the original scenes, they were animated much better. But even when not comparing, when you see Gwen turn into aliens, three out of her only four transformations, she doesn't really do much. Heat Blast, she just kind of stands around and makes her name. Gray Matter, she runs around from a raccoon. Forearm, she goes bowling. And the only action scene we see is a recreation of something we already saw. Like I said earlier, I would have really liked to see Gwen go up against Vilgax. And as much as I appreciate all the callbacks and parallels to the previous story, the episode is titled Gwen 10, but the story still feels too much like it's about Ben. Importance, that's where I struggle with. The episode itself isn't all that important, but I would definitely argue you are completely missing out on the Ben 10 experience if you skip this episode. Something like this is just too big of a deal to ignore, and even though it doesn't have anything to do with the overall plot or world building, this is something that if you want to walk away from a rewatch feeling like you really get Ben 10, I definitely think this episode deserves to be included in the bunch. And entertaining, of course, I feel like I'm generous enough to give it a 5. It's just a great episode. It's a fun ride going back and seeing all the changes in the world, and ending it on such an open-ended situation. While it is very frustrating when you're craving the knowledge and answers to my previous questions, it's also fun to speculate. It's a fun episode, what can I say? That puts Gwen 10 at a 20 out of 25. Season 2 seems to be doing pretty well for itself so far. Due to the nature of this episode, obviously there's no roadmap update, and my final thoughts would pretty much be what I already said. We see in this episode that Gwen understands her alien's abilities a lot easier than Ben did at first, which gives off the impression she would be much better with the Omnitrix than Ben. But many times in this series with episodes we've already watched, and of course the many episodes in the future, we come to know it's Ben's boldness and bravery and very creative solutions to issues that makes him worthy of the Omnitrix. There's many situations where Ben and Gwen would have done two different things that I feel Ben's version would have resulted in the better outcome. And although this episode ends with Max using the Omnitrix, we don't get to see how his heroics would play out too much. But we do know a lot about his character. So for this week's poll, I'm asking you this. Who do you think, after many years of experience and training, assuming they all have a fair amount of time to use the Omnitrix, and go through more or less the same chain of events, who do you think would put the Omnitrix to best use? Ben? Gwen? or Max. This poll will be up about a day after this episode drops, so if you're watching this breakdown the day it comes out, don't forget to come back tomorrow to cast your vote. Okay, so real quick, I want to bring up something that I didn't notice until I was editing. Though drones that would have fought Wild Mutt didn't just disappear, they were actually never fired. You can see the two drones are still attached to the robot's shoulders during the battle with Diamond Head. So my previous statement about them disappearing was a plot hole? Well, that was just plain wrong. Sorry about that. I also want to thank you guys for supporting these breakdowns and giving me such a strong positive reaction of people wanting more. It means a lot to me that people are interested in the thoughts I have on my favorite series, and I'm glad that I get to share it with you guys in an entertaining way. New breakdowns will come out every Friday until we get through all four series, and yes, I'm also doing the movies. But until then, you can stay up to date with everything that we do on our social medias and join the Discord for some fun community interaction. You can also join the Patreon for $1 a month for exclusive weekly updates on both and beyond, 5YL, and everything that we're working on currently. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I'll see you next Friday but until then keep it fizzy